Good afternoon. We all remember, I would think, the uh, scriptures about the eunuch and the chariot. And we're going to look at him and see if we can find anything that will help us to grow. The title of the lesson, Would You Stop Your Chariot? Would you? You know, things happen in life and you wonder why that happened. Maybe a breakdown. Why did I break down here? Uh, things happen in life, and sometimes we don't really appreciate why they happen. This eunuch was the treasurer of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. He was a, definitely a God fearing man. He was returning from Jerusalem to worship, he'd gone to worship God Jehovah. He believed in God. He was a God-fearing man. Acts 8, 26 through 40, I want to actually read the whole thing. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Acts 8, 26 through 40, we'll read it together. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert. So he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was coming back, not going. He was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Remember, Isaiah prophesied about the coming Christ. Then the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. That needs to be the way that we have a Bible study with anybody. I'm not going to tell you what I think. I feel I'm going to try to guide you through God's Word. And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. <clears throat> he was led to a sh as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Did they have a huge Bible study for months and months and years and years? Listen to these next verses. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. The Gospel. How much do you have to know to be baptized? Are you to be a scholar? Do you need to go to a uh, preacher's uh, college and learn all there is to learn about theology? He taught him Jesus. He evidently, he was struck with the heart. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, here is water. What keeps me from being baptized? Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. He didn't dip his hand into the water and sprinkle him. He went down into the water. Now when they came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit of the Lord called Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. 
But Philip was found at Azotus and passed through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Sometimes when we travel, we're forced to stop. We always don't know why. Sometimes in life, we have to take a detour. Sometimes in life, because of tribulations, we're set back to a point to where we start introspecting our own hearts. Sometimes trying to fathom what is going on around me. Sometimes, for the first time in a long time, we actually look at ourselves instead of others. He was reading from Isaiah. 53, 7 through 8 is what the eunuch was reading. It's about the affliction of God's Son, Jesus Christ. He didn't understand what it was. And even though he may have been inconvenienced stopping there in a desert, something great happened for the good, especially in his own personal life, didn't it? Let's look at this account and let's uh, and ask the question, why did the eunuch stop his chariot? Why? It's obvious that the eunuch was trying his best to know more about God's Word and studying how to get to heaven. Why does somebody finally submit to a Bible study? Same reason. Why does somebody finally submit to repentance? And let everybody know that he straightened himself out with God. That's some small little details. He had to make sure they were right so he could go to heaven. Why did he do that? He wants to go to heaven. It's really a simple, simple lesson. There is value in one soul. How many times have I heard people say, well, you just don't know how bad I am. I don't know how bad you are. Probably no worse than I am. Probably not as bad. I know a lot of people worse than both of us. So often we stumble over diamonds, you see, because they're under a rock. And we don't want to give any effort in finding these valuable diamonds, just like the eunuch. A eunuch from Ethiopia, a man over treasury with lots of authority, sitting on a chair in the middle of the desert. Why in the world would I even care about that man? He probably wouldn't listen to me anyway. He's, told me he's too far lost. Well, in this scenario, there was a diamond under every rock, and one of them was the eunuch. If one knew there was a diamond, a real diamond under a rock, I could see just about any man going to get a mattock, a pick, a shovel, Anything he could to pry that rock up and grab that diamond. But how much effort will I personally go to help save a soul? Well, you're not going to get anything from it. So I'm not interested. It's not the attitude of a Christian at all, is it? Philip left a large crowd. A large crowd he left for one soul. Acts 8, 4-5, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip came down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the thing concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. He was, he was getting a victory on every corner. I'm sure he was elated to all these baptisms going on. Why would you leave there and go after one poor old soul? Is that important enough for me to go after one soul, as religious as I am? Men and women both were baptized. Yet this one soul. You're telling me he left all these people, all this good work, to go save one soul. It reminds me of what it's like when we take our time, our busy time, let's say here because this is such a friendly, loving congregation. We're all having a good time because we do that when we come together. 
we come together to stir up good works. I want to point out something too. At the size of my congregation, if I see an empty seat, I know who's not here. If I see a full seat, I expect to see that person there. And that's the way it always is. And you're the same way. And it affects us when that seat's not filled. Don't, don't. It, it does. It affects us. So we need to keep that in mind. Because our brothers and sisters need our encouragement. And part of the act of encouragement is your simple attendance to be sitting beside them, winking at them, shaking their hand, saying something nice. It goes so far in this old nasty world, it means everything. But to encourage someone that's here, to uh, invite them to worship or a Bible study or help a weaker brother or sister, there's really just not much self-gain as far as the world can see and all that. But again, I would turn this pulpit over if it was a rock. And that probably weighed a thousand pounds. I'd find a way. If I knew there was a diamond under it. How much trouble will I go over helping one of my brother or sisters to be strong, encouraging them, to reach out to some lost soul that don't even look worth talking to, to try to help them find their way to heaven. Philip ran over to the chariot and began preaching the good news about Jesus. That's it. Remember, he simply taught the eunuch about Jesus. Not some big, long college education. He just taught him about the power of Jesus on that cross. You know, I believe any one of us sitting here right now, especially the children here, I know a lot about these children. I hear a lot of beautiful tales about the children. We don't have a child with us today that couldn't sit down and teach anybody about Jesus. Every man and woman in this congregation can teach anybody about Jesus. I heard an elder one time say to a fella, he said, I'd go do this, but I haven't studied enough. I don't know enough yet. He said, you know, don't ever take the sword which represents the Holy Bible and your knowledge. What is your knowledge? Enough to just teach somebody about Jesus. That's a sword. It, it brought this man right here, the eunuch, to Christ. If you sharpen that thing by studying and studying and studying, representing sharpening that sword, one of these days, when you finally feel like, I've got enough knowledge now, I can pull a sword, you pull, a little, pull out a little pocket knife because you've sharpened it all the way down to nothing. Pull your sword out and teach Jesus. That's all. Just teach about Jesus. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7-10. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In your earthen vessel, your body, lies a soul, a spirit, a heart, compassion, love, caring for others, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. When we help bring someone to Christ, we give God the glory. We are hard-pressed on every side. We are. You go where? You believe what? We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, confused sometimes, but not in despair. We're persecuted from time to time as Christians that believe there's only one doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 9. Yes, we believe that baptism is essential to salvation. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. From our last lesson, when we're struck down, we become like concrete. We become stronger than we've ever been before. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be shown 
in your body. The diamond is in all of us. All of us. Sometimes it's not shown because we stand in the way ourselves. Very, very few times do you see somebody being a stumbling block that's a Christian of another Christian. But often you see a Christian standing in the way of being what he ought to be. He holds himself back. There's so many lost souls, there's so few people that are out trying to save souls. They don't let the power given to them by God and His Word come out. The power of the story of Jesus Christ on that cross, how He got there, what He went through, and it's all for me and you, is as powerful as it gets. So let's not be sharpening our sword all of our lives and end up with a nail clipper one day to try to go out and cut somebody's heart. The kingdom of God advances one soul at a time. Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs. You know what an heir is. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together with Christ. It's not about me. I don't think I'm strong enough. Well, who cares? Do you know about Jesus? Well, I know about Jesus. Then go share it with somebody. But I may not know it all. And I don't either. I've never met anybody that does. James Watkins told me he didn't know it all. He know more than I do. I know enough. You know enough. We've all heard you can't swallow the whole elephant with just one bite. You have to eat it a bite at a time. Imagine just being a, a small part. You're in heaven now. You're sitting there in pure awe. For how many in our life years? Thousands and thousands of years just stunned by the beauty of it. Glenn was showing us a lot of pictures back there in the uh, fellowship hall as his son Troy was. And every picture was just better than the other one. They just kept getting better and better and better. Mm. You know, I can't imagine how beautiful heaven is going to be. The aurora lights, the sun sets and rises here on the Tennessee River or on the beach of the great oceans won't touch or fathom the beauty of heaven. You're there. And you're so excited and elated about it. And then you walk up on a soul. And you recognize that soul. And that soul says, I want to thank you. You know, if you hadn't said these few encouraging words to me one day, I wouldn't be here. You know, if you hadn't reached out and gave me a little hug that day, shook my hand, told me you loved me, I wouldn't be here today. If you hadn't invited me to church, I wouldn't be here today. If you had not been there, being my example of where I need to be when people are worshiping God, I probably wouldn't be here today. I love you for it. What would that do to your heart in heaven? Do you think you might just feel good? Whew, that would enhance the joy. That describes that there are degrees in heaven. Because the more people you help get there, the more joy I believe you're going to find. If I'm a co-heir with the saints to the Son of God Himself, do you not believe you would have an exhilarating joy to see them there in heaven? Jesus warned His disciples to follow Him and become fishers of men. we got some great fishermen in here. We um, celebrate that every fall, I understand. I know we did this last year. I ate fish till about got sick. we got some great fishermen in here. He said, follow me. Chapter 4, Matthew 18 through 20. Follow me. I want to describe fishing to you. I've seen Troy do it. Now it's my turn. 
the rod could represent my arm, my reaching out, my, my reaching out to someone. The reel could be my effort trying to reel somebody in to a Bible study in the church or coming back to our worship services, coming back so that I can find joy in them being sitting here looking at me so the preacher don't feel like he's run everybody off. The reel could represent a lot of things. Outreach. The hook could represent the love of Jesus and His promises. Let's teach, preach Jesus and His promises to everybody. And the bait is simply the Word of God. Now I'll tell you one more little thing about fishing and about the message of Jesus. You don't have to be a great fisherman, because I'm certainly not. But I learned this when I was young, and I was able to go fishing with my step-grandfather. Took me along a lot of times. You take a hook, you put a worm on it. I know all these fancy baits that people use now, but I never got to use any of that. I had a worm. And I put a worm on the end of that hook. And I dropped that worm in the water. Well, it'll float up here, and I'd watch that float. And when that float would go down, my grandpa would say, Jerk it, John. Bam! I remember jerking that thing one time so hard, the hook came back, and I threw it again, and it hooked him right in the side of the face. I'll never forget that. But the point is, I caught fish. I didn't even know what I was doing. If I had baited the hook with 10 worms, 10 pounds of worms, had 50 hooks on the end of one line, I would have never caught a fish had not I thrown it into the water. I will never bring anyone to Christ. I will never help anyone come to Christ, return to Christ, unless I throw the hook in the water. Got to try. Got to open my mouth. And talk about Jesus. What will it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Mark 8, 36 through 37. We can't carry one penny with us to heaven. But we can rejoice from now through eternity about helping to reel one soul into the body of Christ or bring one back. I guess I could represent that by one fish I remember. I was fishing off the pier and I was so happy and proud, a little boy. He said, you get that hook out of that fish's mouth. I said, I've never done that. And he gave me a pair of pliers. And I put my foot on that fish and I caught that hook out. And I looked up proud as punch and pulled my foot off that fish and it just bounced right off in the water. <laughs> Ooh! That's what happens in worship service. Sometimes the greatest Christians we've ever seen fall away. Somebody's got to reel them back. Whether you can or not, you'll never know unless you throw the worm in the water. Have you ever considered if one knows the gospel and how to get to heaven? Have you ever considered if one remembers scriptures like a computer? I don't. Have you ever considered if one shows up every time the doors are open but does not obey God's Word, does not have His heart and His love into it? Have you ever considered you will lose your own soul if you're guilty of any of that? Romans 8, 1 through 2 teaches us, 1 through 2 teaches us to walk according to the Holy Spirit. How do I know what the Holy Spirit wants me to walk? Well, he wrote every word of this, brother and sister, as he moved through man. you got to study to show yourself approved. This walk that it's talking about encompasses all of the Lord's command. It encompasses an obedient faith. Not half obedient. Not sort of obedient. In other words, not flirting with being committed to Christ. Not 
flirting with acting like a Christian, but being a full-blown, committed Christian. It encompasses repentance, spreading the gospel, and reaching out and trying to help every soul that I possibly can. That is walking in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels. I mean, I when, when you hear my voice, it's just like an angel speaking. But I have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clang, clanging cymbal. In other words, my words mean nothing if my love and heart doesn't come behind them. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can even remove mountains, but have not love, listen, I am nothing. Nothing! And you can't be nothing and go to heaven. The heartbeat of our faith is obedience. Hope is our guide. Love guides our actions. Love guides my responses. Love guides my words. Can I overcome my mouth? It's up to me. But the one key ingredient here that will help me overcome all that is a thing called love. True love. Real compassion. I feel sorry for so many people in this world that call themselves macho that can't look at another person and say, I love you. I feel sorry that I've seen this myself and you have too. Where a man or woman married to someone can never look at the other one in the eye and say, you know what? I love you. That's, that's a shame. Being religious and good doesn't equal salvation. The eunuch was an important person in the court of the Queen of Ethiopia. He would have been trusted and respected. Deuteronomy 23.1 The good man traveled over 1,000 miles to Jerusalem. That's, that's a man that loves God. To worship even though he would have probably been denied the assembly. Huh? As important as he was a Gentile. You know how we hated the Gentiles. I'm glad they don't hate this Gentile because I'm a Gentile too. Salvation is found through Jesus and being buried with him in baptism. Being buried with him in baptism for the remission of my sins, Acts 2.38, I believe, and I've been baptized, so I should be saved, Mark 16, 16. I was buried, the old man, my old man, and your old man or woman was buried. Why? Because you were sinful. But when you were, went into the watery grave of baptism and were resurrected up out of the waters, you were a new creature. Because you've been baptized into the body of Christ, Galatians 3, 27. You see, you cannot go to heaven unless you're baptized with water and the Spirit. Period. John 3, 5. Nothing should stop a person from obeying the truth. The unit commanded the chariot to stop. Why? He knew what he needed to do. He wanted to study. That's all. What prevents me or you from being baptized? Nothing but ourselves. After we've been taught the plan, Christ gave us how to be saved. Some people allow inconvenience to get in the way, not only of being baptized, but of repenting. Not only of baptizing and being repentance, but being the example of full commitment. It's an inconvenience. I don't have time right now. I'm going to get in my way. i got something much more important to do than go try to save a soul. I've got to straighten my sock drawer. Acts 24, 25, because of fear, Felix waited for a more convenient time. If we could ask Felix right now what he thinks, I don't think he'd be waiting for a more convenient time. He just wanted another chance. 
Some people allow pride to get in their way of being baptized, of being repented, or being committed. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride always stands, always goes before destruction. Some people allow the past to get in their way. You don't know how bad I was. Paul thought he was the chief of all sinners. So do we. But Paul made it. He got out of the way of himself. Some people allow family to get in the way. How does that happen? They don't have enough love for God, love for their own soul, and love for their souls to stand up and say, I'm going to worship service, and you're not stopping me. I'm going to be baptized, and nobody's going to stop. I'm going to repent of my sins, and ain't nobody going to get in my way. I'm getting 100% committed. I'll knock the doors down of that church out there. The next business meeting, they'll be saying, who keeps turning to do me? Because you ain't stopping me from being here. I'm 100% committed. Excuses. The chariot of men usually runs at full speed and never stopping where it counts. Is what I'm saying. We miss great blessings when we fail to obey God's Word. The chariot stopping that day was the greatest blessing in the life of this Ethiopian. The eunuch was baptized after he was simply taught what? Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Why, well, yeah. Then go teach Him. That's all it takes. Well, I don't know if I'm going to throw my worm in the water at my ground. <laughs> Psalms 32.1 Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This is who I want to be. I hope I'm looking and staring and standing right in front of the fishers of men. Women, you can be a fisher woman. Go fish. I may change the name of this sermon I've ever preached it again. Go fish. Hmm. Plan of salvation one more time. We always end with it. We know what we got to do. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on baptism. I'm not even going to spend a lot of time on repentance. We all know what we need to do. I am going to spend a little bit of time on commitment. We all have weaknesses. But I'm telling you, even if you have been baptized, even if you have repented, in order to have assurance of going to heaven, you got to be committed to Christ. And commitment shows up in your actions and your not actions. It shows up in the words you say and in the words you don't say. It shows up in every facet of your life. Inspect yourselves. If you have a need, come forward as we stand and as we sing.